Hello and welcome to The Print. I'm TCA Sharad Raghavan, Deputy Editor. And today I'm going to be in conversation with Dr. D. Subar Rao, former RBI Governor, but also so much more. Over a career spanning 35 years in the Indian Civil Services, Dr. Subar Rao is well versed with how the Indian Administrative Service works. And of course, because of his time at the RBI, he's really, really well versed with our financial system. So thank you so much, Dr. Subara, for joining us. Thank and you. also, congratulations for your book. Uh, it's called Just a Mercenary. And this one, I believe, is about uh, your time in the civil services, whereas your previous book about who moved my interest rate is about your time at the RBI. So congratulations on the thank book you. and thank, thank you, you for really. joining us. Thank you. So now, since this book has to do with your time in the civil services, I'll start with a question on our bureaucracy, which is, according to you, what are five really key reforms that are needed in the Indian bureaucracy right now? Well, that's a very wide canvas question, but let me attempt to capture my response in a, in a minute, a couple of minutes. Sure. Which is that I was a member of the IAS, I'm most familiar mm -hmm. with the IAS, so I'll talk about reforms that are required in the IAS. First is the recruitment. Okay. Admittedly, there is no known system of examination that can test the administrative capability of a person, especially if the person is 25, 30 years old. Right. So we have to admit that. But how do we refine the examination system so that the best get in and those who get left out, the, some of the good ones don't get left out, you know, eliminate both type 1 and type 2 errors. Right. That's the first reform. Second, I think there's got to be a reform on career management okay. of civil servants, uh, of uh, encouraging them to acquire breadth early in their career, allowing them to specialize and use their specialization later in the career as they move up. Right. So there's got to be much more focus on career management. All right. There's got to be focus on allowing opportunities for civil servants to specialize. Mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, somewhat related to career management. There got to be opportunities for training, in-service training, okay. uh, uh, related to the candidate's personality and uh, uh, skill profile, as well as track record and experience. Mm -hmm. Finally, I believe, perhaps in my view, the most important, there's the, the system of rewards and penalties has to be completely reformed because in the current system I think there is not enough encouragement for performance and there is not enough penalty for non-performance. I see. So uh, now coming to the testing, the first point that you made, how would you go about then refining the testing process to judge whether a 25 year old has good administrative capabilities. See, I must say uh, here that over the last 50 years since I appeared for the civil services, they have improved the civil service exam. Uh, you know, now there is a prelim, there is a main exam, and uh, it is uh, structured more to test the maturity of a candidate, his or her ability to communicate, etc. It's certainly improved. Right. And as I said, there's no known system of examination mm -hmm. that uh, test this. As much as you focus on improving that, I think there must also be a system whereby IAS officers are tested every 10 or 15 years over their career span right. uh, to see how they good they are. And if they're not good enough, either they're given opportunities for improving themselves or sent away, uh, which is in some sense related to the last reform I pointed right. out, which is the system for rewards and penalties. And I was actually going to come to that next uh, because one of the, from outside, one of the main criticisms of uh, India's uh, IAS and all of the civil services is that the officers cannot be removed from their jobs unless the, the error that they've made is absolutely huge. Yeah. So all they get is a transfer to other right. departments. And so do you suggest that, I mean, there should be harsher penalties? I think so. Uh, like in the army and the armed forces, right? If you're, uh, they're tested when they're 20, 25 years, uh, they're put in that service. 
if they are capable of going up and some of them are given an option to go away and some of them are eased out okay so i think the ias also should institute some arrangement like that so that there is pressure on officers to perform and of course admittedly designing a system whereby you can test an officer who is put in about 25 years is more difficult than designing a system at the entry level right, right? but you got to make sure that uh, it is uh, well structured there there is no biases in that mm -hmm. and that uh, it is seen to be fair and unbiased i understand and uh, now as a, a little bit of a follow up to this uh, what is your stand on lateral entry because that's been an issue now uh, uh, talked about about how people from outside the yeah. civil services people who have not given the exam are brought in because yeah. they have their own expertise i am all for lateral entry in fact i am for lateral entry not of the trickle lateral entry that happens now they take mm -hmm. a handful of people five or six people every year and they sent out after four years that is not what i consider lateral entry okay in fact what i have in mind is a two tier entry into the ias and other civil services the one is when a candidate is in the age group of 25 to 30 right and another when a candidate is in the age group of 37 to 42 for example okay? i see so as i said earlier if you actually weed out 15 20 or 25% of people who enter when they young 25 to 30 mm -hmm. you make space for this mid level professionals to come in and they will continue forever they will become part of the regular ias they're not lateral entry that they serve for 3 4 years and go away right. they come with their expertise that they have acquired in non ias careers mm -hmm. for 15 years bring that expertise and specialization bring a sense of world view into the ias see one of the problems with the ias as it did it was with me was that i finished my college and within 15 days i reported for the ias training in the sense right. that i never experienced the world as a non ias officer i understand that experience of the world i believe is very very important and this second tier of en lateral entry i wouldn't call it lateral entry but i would call it a second tier entry into mm -hmm. the ias i think uh, fills that gap i see but uh, they'll surely be some resentment from within the system that how are you coming from outside well they they coming these candidates who are 25 to 30 also mm -hmm. came from the outside did they not it's true yeah right so they are coming from the outside but they coming in for good as career ias officers right. they're not you know time uh, 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 time based a contract based entry, contract based lateral right. entrance as is the practice now right i understand and uh, now given how different the indian economy is right now from say when you gave the civil services exams and uh, joined the services do you feel that the indian bureaucracy is prepared for the indian economy of 2024 it's digital it's more fast paced and there's an argument to be made that uh, it needs less bureaucracy not more it certainly needs less bureaucracy as the prime minister said uh, you know less government more governance right uh, so certainly the economy the country needs less, less bureaucracy and it's not a question of whether the current level of bureaucracy current cohort of bureaucrats are able to provide less bureaucracy i think they are quite prepared to handle digital technologies okay okay you there is need there need be no presumption that the current cohort of bureaucrats are unable to deliver administration with the help of digital technologies that presumption need not be there mm -hmm. but at a larger level let me respond to your question you know i was in the ias right uh, when the reforms were instituted in the 90s and since then one of the questions raised even then was that reforms meant yield in the government yielding space to the markets and all the bureaucrats are structured to performed from within the government are they mentally intellectually prepared to yield space to the markets right and are they prepared to work uh, in a situation in an economy which is uh, wh where the private sector has much larger importance right and civil servants have proved that they are up to the task 
in fact, some of the most uh, significant reforms since the 1990s have been initiated and implemented by civil servants. So I would not go with your suggestion that civil servants are ill-equipped if reforms mm -hmm. are deepened. They'll have to be trained, of course, uh, but there need be no presumption that they are unprepared or inadequate to the requirement of administration with digital technologies. I understand. And uh, now coming a little bit to the RBI, <coughs> uh, after experimenting with two governors who were outside the civil services, who came from outside, were trained outside, the RBI once again with Shakti Kanta Das went back to a civil servant who became the RBI governor. Now, uh, Mr. Das's term is coming to an end by the end of uh, this year. So, do you feel that the RBI should stick to this formula of... Uh, you mean the government? Uh, sorry, should the government uh, stick to this uh, formula of appointing a civil servant to the RBI governor position? Or should it again try to look, for, look outside? You know, there are, there have been 25 governors so far, including uh, Mr. Shakti Kanta Das. Yes. They come with varied backgrounds, mm -hmm. some from an academic background, some as economists uh, who have had some exposure to the government, some civil servants like Dr. Reddy, right. uh, myself and uh, Mr. Das. And I think they've all served the economy and served the institution mm -hmm. to the best of their ability. I don't see any correlation between the background of the governor and his performance as the governor. So, when the position opens up, whenever it does, I think the government should look for the best candidate available and appoint him or her. I want, I'm saying significantly her. Right. I understand. And uh, so, you don't feel that there is innately an advantage of having somebody, say even from the finance ministry, moving to the RBI just because those two bodies need to communicate so closely with each other? Not necessarily. I think it's possible even for uh, somebody who's come from outside the system mm -hmm. to establish communication channels with the government. I see. And uh, now back again, I take it to the uh, administrative services. The, is there a need to review the number of years uh, that a particular term of an officer is in a, in a particular ministry. As in, is there any value if, say, a minister uh, or, a, or an officer in the mines ministry, after three years is shifted to education or to health, or somebody in finance is shifted to something like power or steel, somewhat unrelated ministries after just three years, do they have to relearn a lot of different things? Are they bringing value? On the first part of your, of your question, which is, uh, should there be a minimum term? Mm -hmm. I think absolutely. The stability is very important. Okay. And uh, officers uh, should be allowed to stay, learn, and perform. For uh, about how long would you say? Maybe three to five years, uh, three years at the minimum. Okay. okay. Uh, so that they're comfortable. Uh, they know that they have... Uh, time enough to learn and perform and deliver. Mm -hmm. I think that's very important in any job, particularly uh, at the senior bureaucratic level. Right. On the second question about shifting from one ministry to another or shifting from one job to another, mm -hmm. the organizing principle of the IAS is in fact uh, the view that journalists bring a larger worldview, breadth, and Taking decisions about policy, formulation, and implementation right. requires both breadth and depth. Mm -hmm. Journalists who come into positions are advised by domain specialists, and decisions are taken by a blend of journalists and specialists. Right. Okay. That is the organizing principle and the rationale for our system. Mm -hmm. okay. Of course, shifting somebody from education to power to social welfare might be inefficient, certainly. Right. So at the senior levels, as we discussed earlier in this conversation, there should be some focus by the government career managers on managing the careers of civil servants, allowing them to specialize in economic ministries. 
right, or social ministries or in development departments. So at the early years, let's say in the first 10 years of a civil servant's career or 15 years, they're allowed to earn bread right. and then they go into debt. I see. I understand. And uh, do you feel these, these uh, career managers, as you call them, they should also be from the IAS or should there be maybe a new service formed for this? I don't think we should need a new service, mm -hmm. but they need not necessarily be from the IAS. You can even have, uh, you know, some people from the outside advising on this. Right. Absolutely. And now uh, in October last year, the Modi government had uh, issued uh, a notification to all the ministries and uh, the civil servants saying that they should showcase the achievements of the ministries over the nine years. Do you feel that this is an appropriate uh, notification to have been given? And should the civil servants have agreed to do this? Most certainly not. Uh, okay. I don't think it is appropriate for a government to ask civil servants to publicize the government's achievement. In other words, turn the civil service into its uh, publicity arm. Right. And were the government to issue such instructions, I don't think civil servants should oblige. Okay, that is inappropriate in our system, right. in any democratic system, that the civil service cannot become a propaganda arm of the government. But having said that, let me nuance my response a little bit. Mm -hmm. If the government issued a blanket instruction like you cited, that is certainly not par for the course. But if the government gave a specific instruction on a specific point to ask, asking the civil servants to publicize, I think that would be par for the course. Let me illustrate that. If, for example, the government asked the civil servants to say how much, what's been the coverage on vaccination. Right. And if the civil services, we've covered 80% so far, okay, that is, might seem as publicity, but it is also encouraging. The remaining 20% to get vaccinated, right? right? So that has a public policy goal. So mm -hmm. specific publicity to specific accomplishments of the government in order to accomplish a larger public policy goal. Mm -hmm. those, those are okay. Right. But a blanket instruction like this is inappropriate. I see. And uh, now, since you have written an absolutely fascinating book, uh, I would love to ask a few questions uh, regarding that. So one of the, the really the gripping parts in the book had to do with the 2G matter. And there you've raised two questions. One is about the presumptive loss figure of uh, rupees 1.76 lakh crore. And the other is about the involvement of the CAG. So, uh, First, about the presumptive loss figure, uh, uh, could you tell us a little bit more about your reservations? Yeah, as you said, uh, the CAG went into two questions. Right. First of all, I want to say that the prerogative of the CAG to conduct a special audit is beyond question, unquestionable. Right. What is questionable, though, is the two things that you mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, the CAG going into the presumptive loss and the assumptions made in estimating the presumptive loss. Right. Let's talk about the assumptions. The CAG came out with four estimates and the highest estimate was 1.76 trillion rupees. I believe the CAG focused almost exclusively on the upfront price of spectrum. Right. Without recognizing that there would be continued revenue for the government by way of spectrum charges. We do not take that into account. Mm -hmm. Also, the CAG did not take into account the multiplier effect of telecom penetration. Right. If telecom penetrates, more and more people use telecom, there would be network effect, there would, yeah, there would be positive impact on the efficiency of the economy. As we're seeing playing out now. Absolutely. And that would accrue to the public. And part of that would accrue also to the government by way of tax revenues. Mm -hmm. So I believe the CAG's narrow focus just on the upfront price of spectrum was uh, inappropriate, incorrect. Right. On the second issue of uh, whether the CAG should have gone into the question of presumptive loss, I have reservations mm -hmm. uh, because it is appropriate. The CAG is questioning the prerogative of a democratically elected government 
to give something below the market price. Right. I would think that is uh, certainly not an issue for the CAE. If a democratically elected government decides that they're going to give spectrum at below market price to serve the, a larger public purpose of deepening the penetration of telecom, I think that is open to the government. And I don't think it is open to the CAG to question that. If indeed the CAG is allowed to go into such questions, mm -hmm. what will then stop the CAG from going into every tax concession given in the budget? and calling that uh, a, a loss of revenue. Or revenue foregone. Revenue. Yeah, I think confusing sacrifice of revenue with loss of revenue has caused the problem. I see. I see. So basically, there, there, there have been a lot of even, say, the corporate tax rate cuts of 2019. That could right. come under question then. Yeah. That, in fact, if you extend that logic, even right. that could be questioned. Absolutely, I understand. And uh, so now as a RBI governor, you worked with three finance ministers. Uh, I mean, one, of course, was Dr. Manmohan Singh when he was prime minister and held the portfolio of finance. And then there was uh, Mr. P. Chidambaram and then Pranam Mukherjee. So who was the easiest to work with, according to you? And who uh, was the most effective finance minister during those years? It will be impolitic for me to compare finance ministers. Right. I had the privilege of working with three distinguished politicians, political leaders, uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh, Mr. Chidambaram, and Mr. Pranav Mukherjee. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had, when Dr. Manmohan Singh was an interim finance minister right. in the stopgap between shifting Mr. Chidambaram to home ministry. Mm -hmm. But between Mr. Pranav Mukherjee and Mr. Chidambaram, I must say that uh, I had differences with both of them. Okay. Uh, we used to discuss the differences. I had reservations against the government's view. And uh, we saw the growth inflation balance differently. We discussed them. There was never any acrimony. Uh, both Mr. Mukherjee and Mr. Chidambaram had regard for the Reserve Bank of India. Right. Both of them had uh, treated me courteously. There was never any acrimony in our discussion, but there was disagreement and we worked with those disagreements because the government was coming with a different worldview of the balance between growth and inflation. And the Reserve Bank, with its core mandate of maintaining price stability, was having a different, was viewing the growth inflation balance differently. Right. And uh, so now this growth inflation debate, in fact, has been carrying on for quite a while. And uh, the RBI, even right now, seems to be quite focused on inflation. Uh, it's, it's trying to get to that 4% mark and it's not taking its sights off it. Do you feel that uh, it might be now focusing too much on uh, inflation and uh, growth, especially because the global economy is also struggling, that growth might start to slow down in India? It will be inappropriate for me. I'm uncomfortable commenting on the RBI's current sure. policy stance. But I do want to say that this growth inflation tension plays out differently in different contexts. Mm -hmm. For example, throw your mind back to 2012 when I was governor. Right. You know, there was concern about stagflation at that time because growth was going down and inflation remained stubborn. Mm -hmm. So there was talk about stagflation, etc. But today, even as the RBI remains focused on inflation, growth is quite comfortable. You know, we're clocking growth of seven, seven plus percent or just below that. Right. So the challenge of managing this tension between growth and inflation is less acute today than it was in a different context. So I think different macroeconomic situations cannot be compared. In other words, you can't compare situations over time as much as you learn from past experience. Right. And uh, now you have had a career spanning more than 35 years, including your time at the RBI. 40 years actually, including RBI. Including RBI more than uh, uh, 40 years. So now what would be the five or three or five <laughs> lowest points of your career? Things that if you had another chance, you'd want to maybe do over or things that you regretted? Well, that's a difficult question to jog back over 50 years of service. There were certainly many regrets, many disappointments. Mm -hmm. But since you asked me very specifically, I must say that uh, I was collector Kamam district 
in combined Andhra Pradesh in the early 1980s. Mm -hmm. uh, I implemented protective legislation for tribals. Kamam had a large segment of tribal population. Uh, they were indebted. Uh, many of them were bonded labor. They lost their land. They lost their money. Uh, and they were living at subsistence levels. Right. So I had implemented headlong, dived headlong into implementing protective legislation, which remained neglected before for a number of reasons. And that project aborted within nine months. I was transferred away. I see. So then I looked back on that. I realized that I should have planned it differently. Mm -hmm. I should have not gone into it headlong without adequate preparation. I did not consult my team. I did not prepare my team. Uh, we did not do sufficient homework. In the process, my concern is whether in order to win the battle, I lost the war. I see. That is certainly one disappointment. Right. Uh, the second disappointment is this uh, high and stubborn inflation uh, between 2010 and 12 mm -hmm. during my tenure. Uh, I realized that I should have raised interest rates faster and steeper uh, okay. than before, than I had actually done. But then again, we were acting in real time within the universe of knowledge available to us, which was telling us that growth was actually slow. It only with the benefit of hindsight, we learned that growth was actually faster than we, real, we knew in real time. Right. So that is another disappointment or regret of my time. Mm -hmm. And third, I believe as governor of RBI, I should have focused more on communication, more than I did. I see. Communication with the public? Communication with the public, with the markets, with all your stakeholders. I see. You feel that, I mean, that is an important area that the oh, RBI needs to focus on? Certainly, most certainly. Uh, central banks need to focus on their communication because communication has become another policy tool for central banks. As you see today, you know, everything that central banks say, their lip movement, that with the tweet, their, if they twitch their eyes and all that, that is seen as a market cue. Absolutely. So central banks have to be, you know, understand that it is one of their responsibilities to guide the markets, but do it in a very measured way, uh, not to mislead them, not to give them false information, uh, not to communicate in such a way that it impacts the credibility of the central bank. It's a very difficult thing, but they have to focus on that. And I don't believe that I had done enough in my tenure. I see. I understand. But uh, on that note, thank you so much for an absolutely fabulous conversation. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Sharad. Thank you for the interview. Thank you.